I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of its members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and the notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time now is 6.01. Okay, um, Mr. Kidd is gonna open us with an invocation. If you would like, uh, please bow your head and join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for loving us. Dear Lord, we just uh, uh, thank you for this special time of year and all that that means, dear God. We just uh, thank you for everyone in this room and their, and their hearts, for our students, their, their passion and their commitment. Lord, we just uh, pray for your protection and uh, over our students uh, during the break. Uh, we pray for our teachers, for our staff, for, for all of those, Lord, and those that uh, also serve to protect us. We thank you. Dear God, just for the many blessings and living in this country and the, and the freedom as we are enjoying tonight and gathering, and we just pray for your guidance and direction and the decisions we make tonight. Dear Lord, just uh, bless this evening together and be with us, and in your name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you, Mr. King. Uh, we have a special treat. It's our Pledge of Allegiance. We have a presentation of Quillip by the uh, Canyon Creek Naval JROTC. It's led by American flag, Cadet Abram Rodriguez, Texas flag, Cadet Hannah uh, Lanvo, right rifle, Cadet Jonathan Vanderhorst, left rifle, Cadet Garcia Wiggins, under the direction of Lieutenant, Lieutenant, Commander, Lieutenant Commander Luis Cortez. Uh, pledges to the flag will be led by specifically Austin Dermott. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Texas flag, um, Kashima Williams. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. So Caney Creek is our feeder school presenting. I'm sorry, Hawk, Hawk. is our feeder school. Hawk. So, yes. Dr. Null, we'll give you, turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, as we started this school year, we've been celebrating a feeder zone at each meeting. And tonight we're excited to celebrate Hawk High School and to start. <laughs> we agree. Yes, we absolutely agree. <laughs> And so to start our celebration tonight, we have a video that we will start with. Here at Hawk High School, we strive to serve the district as a resource for students who may want or need a non-traditional learning experience. Our goal is to give the students of CISD another path in order to see them through to graduation. The staff at Hawk focuses on using academic strategies that go beyond the traditional classroom with diverse learning environments. We ensure that each of our students will have the academic and emotional support in order to succeed in their life goals. Hawk High School is making positive differences in students' lives. Here are a few of their stories. Because of Hawk, 
I'll be the first to graduate in my family out of high school. Because of Hawk, I am building a better future for my daughter and myself. Because of Hawk, I'm the president of the Interact Club, and I'm raising money to build a well in Nicaragua. Because of Hawk, I will graduate with my high school diploma and a certificate from Lone Star for welding at the same time. This will be one of the greatest milestones for myself and my family. Because of Hawk, I was able to be mentored by the Silver Foxes group. Because of Hawk, I am encouraged to work on my clothing business and continue the dream of working in the fashion industry. Because of Hawk, I am finally successful in all of my classes. Because of Hawk and Diego from Lone Star, I was able to apply for college, take my TSI test, and get FAFSA help all right here at Hawk. Because of Hawk, Puedo continuar mi educación. Because of Hawk, I get to jumpstart my career as a veterinarian by taking certified medical classes. Because of Hawk High School and its amazing teachers, I am now working for Montgomery County Sheriff's Office. Because of Hawk, I am able to take law enforcement classes to eventually become a ranger. Because of Hawk, I am the leader on my campus. I am the key to the communication between staff and students. Because of Hawk and its supportive staff, I was able to go on and become a teacher within CISD. Because of the newcomer program at Hawk, I can dream of being a bilingual teacher. And we are doing amazing in school. We are so thankful we got to start at Hawk. Because of Hawk, I was able to get my life back together and become an attorney at law at one of the biggest firms in Philadelphia. Because of Hawk, I'm being successful at Lone Star College Kingwood Cosmetology. Thank you for this opportunity to show how Hawk High School has made a positive difference in so many individual lives in CISD. Because of Hawk. Good evening, Vice President Williams, Board of Trustees, Dr. No. I'm Dr. John Williams. I'm the principal of Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> At this time, I'd like to recognize uh, my staff and teachers. Would you please stand and be, be recognized? <laughs> I'd also like to recognize those students that are here from Hawk as well. If you're here, stand and be recognized. I'd also like uh, Ms. Flo Lizenby, if you would come forward. Uh, we'd like to recognize our, some of our newcomers. Good evening. My name is Flo Lizenby, and this is my my uh, co-teacher, her name is Adriana Guarinos. We, um, I teach ESL and she teaches Spanish in the CISD pilot program called the Plazas Comunitarias, at hoc. This program is a collaboration between CISD and the Mexican Consulate in Houston. And we are currently on our second year of implementation. And today we will introduce you this uh, Two wonderful graduates of the Plaza's first year, um, Chesenia Paz Membreño and uh, Karen Hernandez. These students, like the majority of the program's target population, completed up to third to fourth uh, grade in their home country. I am proud to inform you that last Friday, these, last la uh, these young ladies received their certificates for elementary and secondary school at the Mexican Consulate in Houston. And now they are uh, students at Conroe High School and they are doing excellent. They are doing very well. Now we have a special presentation to the board. Uh, it's going to be presented by uh, a couple of our teachers, Ms. Terry Sanders and Ms. Stephanie Stoker.
Good evening. I'm Terry Sanders. I'm art teacher at Hawk. And I'm Stephanie Stoker. I'm the social, social studies teacher. Art and social studies paired for a cross-curriculum project called Bowls for the Board. The students created handmade paper mache bowls and designed their bowl with no one is no one has a perfect life. 54 students participated. 15 bowls were selected by the faculty at Hawk to represent this project. The remainder of the bowls will be donated to empty bowls with the Montgomery County Food Bank. Uh, students reflected on their past personal life experiences, studied Japanese culture, and how, like a phoenix, they have risen from the ashes to become who they are today at Hawk. Like the cracks in their bowls, they were broken, and Hawk has mended them together to create success. Absolutely. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As you'll see, there's a story behind yeah. each bowl. I see that. And uh, our kids have many stories. At this time, Ms. Amber Sullivan, our uh, librarian, would like to make a special presentation to our guest. Hello, everybody. I am Amber Sullivan. And as the librarian at Hawk, I get to collaborate with some amazing community individuals that come to work with our students. On behalf of the school, I would like to recognize a few of those individuals tonight. 10 years ago, a group of friends were looking back on all their life's accomplishments, and the idea was mentioned that it would be neat to share that knowledge with young men. The group of men emailed all the high schools in the surrounding area with the idea of mentoring young men. Only one school replied with interest. That school was Hawk. For an entire decade now, this group of men who named themselves the Silver Foxes have come to Hawk twice a month to have lunch with chosen groups of young men to discuss everything from life's goals to understanding finances. And sometimes the daily discussion turns into anything weighing on the students' minds. And the Silver Foxes graciously listen, give advice, and share their own personal stories. For 10 years, the Silver Foxes have mentored countless of young men at Hawk, and we are incredibly grateful. Silver Foxes, please come up. Well, on behalf of the school board, we, we want to show our appreciation for what you guys do. We know you make a huge difference in the, in the lives of these kids, and, and we would like to honor you with a plaque, and I'm going to read it and kind of put you on the spot here for just a second. I'm sure you're probably not comfortable with that, but you're going to get it, all right? <laughs> so Patron Influencing Education Award presented to Silver Foxes by Conroe ISD Board of Trustees, Trustees in appreciation of your commitment and dedication to the students of the Conroe Independent School District. We really appreciate what you guys are doing. It's making a difference. The video that we just saw, it, it says it all. So we want to give you this plaque. And we also have, you're going to have to figure out a way to share it. <laughs> we have a pie for you as well. But thank you so much for that. students come to Hawk thinking they're not college material simply because they don't even know where to start. Often there's no one that can sit with students to show them how to apply and how to meet all the requirements. But luckily for our students, we have Diego. 
Diego comes to Hawk every other week and sits with each and every senior throughout the school year to discuss a life plan, how to make it a reality, and helps them fill out the Lone Star application. Diego is our representative from Lone Star. He even brings in financial aid representatives that sit with the seniors and help them fill out the FAFSA right on school campus. Um, already this year, Diego has met with over 50 seniors to begin the planning, application process, and FAFSA. 13 of our December graduates from last night had already even taken the TSI test on our campus and were ready to enroll in college classes before they even walked across that graduation stage. But Diego doesn't stop at seniors. He also checks in with our dual credit students and helps them prepare for careers after their welding and machining certificates are finished. And last week, he even did a classroom presentation to freshmen. <laughs> he was able to um, help them understand what Lone Star has to offer and how it is so accessible being right here in our community. Diego single-handedly gets every Hawk graduate options for their future options that they never even thought they were capable of simply because they didn't have someone to explain it to them. But luckily for them and us, we have Diego. Diego, come on up. Uh, you're not done yet either, Diego. <laughs> You know, when you, when you do ex ex exceptional things as you're doing, we, we want to recognize you as well because uh, allowing these kids to come to you and being, being accessible to them and, and showing them the way. Sometimes all they need is a little direction and sometimes they need some hand holding and sometimes they need somebody pushing them along the way and, and you're there to do all of those things. But at the end of the day, these kids are grateful for what you do because you're helping make a difference in their lives and everybody in here is is behind that it's it's easy, easy to support and uh, but what you're doing is going above and beyond and, and you may not think that that's what you're doing but you're going above and beyond and helping kids out that need that need some help so we want to give you an award as well on, on behalf of the school board um, I'm going to read this to you as well this is patrons influencing education uh, presented to Diego Lara by the Conroe Independent School Board of Trustees in appreciation of your commitment and dedication to the students of the Conroe Independent School District. You also get a pie, and I don't see anybody else up here, so you don't have to share your Diego, we thank you and, and all of Lone Star College. He's a, just a, an example of the great people. Uh, we are fortunate to have Lone Star College right here in our school district. And uh, from Dr. Rebecca Riley and through the entire organization, uh, even Chancellor Head, uh, they are dedicated to our students in Conroe ISD, and you're a perfect example of that. So we say thank you. Outstanding. Thank you. Well, in closing, I'd like to thank the board for taking this time to recognize Hawk and giving us an opportunity to show you a little bit of what we do. Um, I'd also like to thank the staff and the volunteers for their tireless effort in helping us achieve our mission of working with students and trying to give them a path to success. Uh, this mission is what drives our efforts each and every day. And because at Hawk, we're <laughs> Thank you. And one last time, I, I didn't want to pass up the opportunity for to speak on behalf of the school board as well. Dr. Williams, we appreciate what you're doing up there. Uh, I've, I've known you for several years now. You, I know you're about caring about giving back. You even helped my own my wife out when she. You guys have worked together. You even gave me some tenor, some some tips on raising my own daughter. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And it worked. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> but we also understand what you guys are about over at, at Hawk. And they're, they're not forgotten kids. They are part of the all means all. 
and these kids get the dedication from your staff and we want you guys to know how important y'all are in their lives and we were able to, to acknowledge a couple of folks here but we would be remiss if we didn't single you guys out as well so thank you so much for for your dedication and for what you're doing and helping change these lives thank you thank Dr. You. Thank Appreciate you. That. thank you thank you uh, mr huber fantastic job dr williams and staff outstanding and we can we'll all here attest to the great things that we see when we go visit hawk and uh, i mean it's above you guys just knock it out of the park and we really appreciate that we see it in the kids we see the dedication uh, that you guys provide i mean a lot of this stuff is one-on-one -on -one oftentimes so you guys are definitely the soul of cisd we really appreciate everything that you do thank you guys <coughs> Um, next item on agenda. Citizens participation. Okay. Citizen participation. Um, Ms. Godfrey. Yes, we have uh, four citizens signed up to speak. Okay. All right. Um, the next 30 minutes has been designated for public participation by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy BD. Please remember that the board may not discuss or act upon any issues that are not posted on our agenda. The board adopted, uh, the board has adopted complaint policies that are designed to secure at the lowest administrative level a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints uh, and concerns. These policies provide that if a resolution can't, cannot be reached uh, administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as properly posted as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of the district's complaint policy can be found on the district's website. Those who have registered for the board uh, will be limited to a five minute presentation. Delega delegations of more than five must appoint a representative to present their views to the board. Ms. Godfrey, please call the first person who has signed up to address the board. Brian Fowler. Thank you. Uh, good evening, CISD trustees and Dr. Knoll and CISD staff. My name is Brian Fowler and I'm a graduate of Conroe High School. I've got four daughters in the Oak Ridge High School feeder zone, two of them that uh, are at the high school. And it, I'm here as a citizen tonight, but it was a pleasure of mine to recently serve on the 2018 uh, bond committee that you're going to consider uh, later tonight. And just so you'll know, I've served on three prior bond committees, the first one in 2008. I've also served on the attendance boundary committee just this last year in 2017. Never before have I spoken as a citizen at a meeting, but uh, based on input from, from my constituents, my, the people in my community that talk to me on a regular basis, I felt uh, a need to address the, the board tonight, so I appreciate the opportunity. First of all, it was a pleasure serving on that committee. <clears throat> Unbelievable amount of information that's given to us and tools presented to us to make these decisions. And, and we've got Cody Bartlett here tonight to talk to you about that, and, and I'm not going to infringe on him, but it was a pleasure. I do want to say that uh, uh, I've told Dr. Knoll and told Dr. Hines, and I, I used to tell Dr. Stockton all the time that truly CISD is the most competent, fiscally conservative government entity I've ever worked with. I've, I'm a former city attorney. I've worked with counties, mud districts, and this this body's unbelievable. Uh, before, uh, and, and that's that's for your leadership and your and your staff's leadership. But before addressing uh, the reason uh, for my comments tonight, I do want the board to know uh, in advance that I do support the recommendations that are going to be brought to you tonight. I'm confident the Oak Ridge Feeder Zone is going to support the recommendations that are brought to you for your consideration tonight. As a member of the uh, Feeder Zone, there's two major concerns that Oak Ridge residents and property owners have had <coughs> the last couple of years. One of them deals with zoning issues and the other deals with the buildings and infrastructure at Oak Ridge High School. And that's what I'm here to address you tonight, not so much the attendance and the boundary and the zoning issues, but the buildings. Um, they do have concerns about the zoning and they wanna make sure that this body gives them the number of students uh, to sufficiently allow that high school to thrive and be successful. But, but I'm here to talk about buildings tonight and infrastructure. Parents constantly come up to me in Oak Ridge and are concerned about the, the structures there at Oak Ridge High School. And a lot of that, quite honestly, is to be expected. It's one of the older high schools in the district and, and there's no finger pointing, but they're just, they're just old. <clears throat> and, and I'm here tonight to argue on behalf of Oak Ridge residents that it's, 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 it's time in our mind 
that this board do something about that because we've got beautiful high schools in this district and we feel that Oak Ridge is deserving. What I found interesting on the committee was we, we got an opportunity to tour. I thought uh, Curtis, uh, Dr. Noll did something this year that we hadn't done in past months. Can we tour those schools? Fantastic idea because we got to see firsthand as committee members. And one of the things that I, I noticed, even the committee members that were not in the Oak Ridge High Feeder Zone, were a little bit amazed or shocked or whatever the word is at the condition of Oak Ridge High School as it compared and related to some of the other high schools in the district. And, and even Conroe High School before these renovations that are upcoming, I heard several comments from committee members about how Conroe even looked uh, nicer in terms of the paint on the walls and things that, that Oak Ridge just needed a facelift. So that's one of the reasons I'm here tonight. And, and, and again, um, one of the things that uh, uh, we, we have to understand is it's an old building. It was designed in a way that's not necessarily the way you design a school today. And it, and it was built at a time where things were different. But there are some things that my community feels like could be addressed, either in this bond uh, money if it passes based on your approval or at a future bond uh, issue. And, and those are the inadequate size and appearance of the auditorium, the lack of a student entryway where the students can come in every day and be proud of the school they go to, lack of f f uh, parking, uh, insufficient parking for juniors, seniors, and sophomores to even drive their cars and park without having to go to the stadium and bus over. Uh, field houses that are in disrepair and in some cases leaking just recently. Uh, front entry safety and design uh, messes where, uh, long story I won't get into, but how parents have to go through the school just to see a child and the nurse, which creates some safety issues in the mind of Oak Ridge residents and property owners. So you'll hear uh, uh, later tonight, the bond committee is making some recommendations regarding the amounts to borrow and the projects to consider, and a large percentage of the recommended bond amount is being awarded to or, or being recommended for Oak Ridge High, obviously Conroe High as well. Um, and I am very grateful for that. Don't get me wrong. If approved by you all, it will be a huge start, in my opinion, for Oak Ridge for a long overdue uh, uh, capital improvement program needed at Oak Ridge High School. The citizens of Oak Ridge will greatly appreciate if you all will approve the recommendations that are being brought to you tonight. But I wanted to point out that a lot of what's being considered or at least talked about up front are are, are not necessarily aesthetic things that we can see and feel and touch, but they're rather, you know, they're rather HVAC, electrical issues, things that definitely Oak Ridge needs and will improve that school greatly. And that's why we're grateful for your consideration of those things. But we'd like to either in this package or a future package, whether that's in four or five, six years, to consider some improvements to the way it looks and feels and, and tastes at Oak Ridge because we've got such great schools in this district. And so, I think I can uh, speak for myself and, and really in summary what I'm, what I'm asking you all tonight is, is just to please consider having a, a strong will and determination, whether it's th this time or in four years, to start putting Oak Ridge on the, on the road map and, and let's see if we can't make it more in line with some of the other great high schools in our district. I just, I grew up here and I, I just feel like the, the this, this district has been blessed beyond belief and it's, it's a, it's a capable district with leadership that I've already described as unbelievable. And there's no reason all these high schools can't be, have buildings and infrastructure that we can all be proud of. And that's, that's really all I wanted to say tonight. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, appreciate Thank you. that. Uh, Mr. Fowler, uh, I can't comment on the substance, but I do wanna make sure that you know how much you are appreciated. And I know there's many of those like you in the audience tonight and, and are out there that put countless hours into making our school district and our community great. You know, we up here, we, we get cookies and different things, but I just want to recognize you and, and those like you that put a lot of time and effort into making our community great. Thank you, Stanley. Thank Agree. You. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Ms. Coffrey. Dr. Enrique Rosero. Good, good evening, board members. My name is Dr. Enrique Rosero. I'm a CISD taxpayer a resident of the Woodlands and a parent of a first grader. I'm not affiliated with any group, club, or political party, and I'm speaking on agenda items seven and eight, the code of conduct of board members and the reorganization of this board. Article seven of the Texas Constitution states that general diffusion of knowledge is essential to the preservation of the liberties and rights of all the people, hence entrusting the legislature with support and maintenance of an efficient system of public free schools 
and school boards for their administration. The pragmatic leadership of previous boards and administrations has ensured that CISD is one of the crown jewels of our community and a reason for people to move to our area and a source of pride on the accomplishments of our children and educators. Ethical standards for board members are an integral part to maintaining this status. The Texas Association of School Boards Code of Ethics for board members states under equity in attitude, quote, I will be fair, just, and impartial in all my decisions and actions, and I will, and I will accord others the respect I wish for myself, and I will encourage expressions of different opinions and listen with an open mind to others' ideas. Now, in contrast, I will read to you some of the public media statements made by new board member, Mr. Dale, Dale Einman. He says, quote, I truly believe liberalism is the cause of many mental health problems, societal ills, family breakdowns, financial strains, and moral bankruptcy in America, end quote. And I will provide printouts for you for the record. Now, to be clear, Mr. Einman is not a qualified professional capable of making health diagnosis about mental health. He's not a professional sociologist or even a trained economics specialist. His inflammatory, divisive, and ill-informed statement is clear evidence of bias, prejudice, an animosity towards a great number of members of this diverse community and nation. The Code of Ethics also under integrity of character says, quote, I will refuse to surrender judgment to any individual or group at the expense of the district as a whole, end quote. By the tally of the last year election for Senate, we can elucidate that almost half of Texans borders supported a, liber a liberal candidate. In addition to that, our diverse and educated district also is home to students from all over the world. They are not morally bankrupt, and they are not mentally ill. Although Mr. Einman is entitled to, to his own views, I am very concerned because I believe public education is one of the last places where regardless of race, background or religion, we come together for a common American experience. So it is not clear to me that from his partisan record that he's capable of discharging the responsibilities of this board in a way that is in tribal. That is not encouraging the idea that we are, choose to, that we are to choose one side and, and stick to it, unable to listen or compromise, and sometimes even unable to be civil all of which results in discriminatory and hostile environments. I urge you today, board members, to organize this board by electing more moderate officials who are able to foster a fair, just, and impartial environment in which to steward our children's education and continue advancing this great district. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Patrice Ward. Hello, good evening. Um, it good, was good, good evening. It was good to hear that uh, us people at a certain school are doing very well. But as you know, I've been here before, and so, and I'm aware of the grievance process. Um, I do write complaints, and I'm here to tell the board I'll continue to utilize the process until my learning disabled daughter passes all of her classes and also becomes a member of the swim team. I was here in August trying to let you know that my daughter was trying out for the swim team. She was a swim team member at the Woodlands College Park and still is not on the swim team at the Woodlands High School. And one of the reasons for that is because she doesn't get accommodations. And I never get a chance to speak with anyone long enough to discuss accommodations. And anything that's thrown in my face is she gets to do a tryout. But what brings me here also is uh, my daughter failed English this semester, right? 
So we have TEA, CISD, and um, the Wilderness High School Art Committee. No one's enacted a solution for her to pass the class. So I've been told by the Art Committee, if they allow her to redo assignments, she'll fall behind. So here she's already failing, and so if she redoes homework assignments to get a passing grade on them, they say she's going to fall behind. That's, that's the only solution I've, I've heard. So when you look up CISD board policy, Texas education law, and Senate Bill 2033, basically they, all three of them say the same thing. The SB 33, or 2033, allows a student to redo homework or retake tests. So it also gives the teacher an opportunity to get, see the student um, learn the material over a six week period. And that way it can show that the student has mastery of the subject and that they, or the material and that they can redo the, um, they can readjust the grade, right? Instead of just giving an automatic grade, right? So that's all I've been trying to ask for because essentially she has more failing grades than passing grades in English. And no one's willing to find a solution for her, okay? So it's overwhelming to me to hear, let her fail, don't make her learn so she can pass, so she can be prepared for upcoming quizzes and tests, okay? So as I um, mentioned earlier, you know, my daughter was transferred to the Woodlands High School this fall because she was failing at the Woodlands College Park. As you recall, I requested a transfer in April 2017 and it was denied. So I met with Curtis Knoll and he denied the transfer. And at that point in time, she had an A in Spanish for the year. So in the fall of 2017, she went to the Woodlands College Park. And there's a big difference between the two in terms of uh, classes because one's a traditional schedule, the other's a block schedule, and coming from a color which has the block schedule, my daughter takes longer to learn, longer to process information, so it was a better school for her to be at. But nonetheless, she had to go to the Woodlands College Park. So during that first semester there, she repeatedly failed every class. Every, every time that there was a class, that's all I received were failing grades on a daily basis. So, you know, she had DA in Spanish at the end of the school year, and then now we're at the next school year, and she didn't even pass anything until about Thanksgiving. So then, at that time, I requested a transfer, but then James Kaker denied that transfer. So she had to remain at the Woodlands College Park for the entire school year, and again, fail, 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 just enough to get by, but still failed the STAR exam, and so had, to, had to retake the STAR exam in the summertime. So again, a wave requested a transfer April 2018 and was denied. So at an appeal meeting in June, uh, so she, my, in uh, 2018, so she was eventually approved. So then we get to July 2019, so I contacted the Woodlands High School swim team coach and told him my daughter has a learning disability and that it would most likely affect her for the tryout. At that point, I didn't know that there was things that should be done for people with learning disabilities for, tr for certain types of tryouts. So, she takes the tryout, she fails it. And um, it's very difficult on someone who's already been on a team, has to go to another school so she can perform better, and then doesn't make that either. So, as I said, I've, um, I've asked numerous times during the semester to meet with the um, athletic director and the coaches to find agreed upon accommodations for the tryout in mid-December. And again, uh, emailed the coach, I asked about um, a swim team clinic, something, just anything to help progress her along, to figure out what it is that he is looking for, for her to be a member of the swim team. I mean, because when we started in January, there's no meets anymore. It's just practice for the remainder of the school year. So, you know, her being a part of a team is good for somebody with learning disabilities for their self-esteem, you know? to be on something and then have to transfer to another school, learn a whole new school and, and way, and then, you know, nothing, nothing's going right for her for that. And as I say, I'm here just to let all of you know I will still keep trying and that maybe somebody here will finally figure it out what is the best solution for my daughter to have, okay? I just want her to pass English or other classes and to be part of the swim team. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it.
Ms. Garfer. Thank you. Emily Hoppel. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate the opportunity to speak to the board. It's been a long time since I've been to a meeting, but I will definitely be making it more of a habit again. Um, I am a uh, ISD taxpayer. I am a mother of three, two who are currently in the district and one who will be. Um, and I'm here tonight to also address our newest board member. Um, on December 7th, on your Dale Inman for Conroe ISD Facebook page, you publicly made a statement that you are a supporter of charter schools and you had posted several posts praising charter schools in other states. Um, when you were questioned by myself and some other constituents, um, your solution was to delete your Facebook page. Um, it's no longer there. And I felt kind of uh, disappointed in that response, that if you have a stance like I support charter schools, that you should be prepared to answer to your constituents about that. Um, I didn't feel that that was very transparent, and I know that that's something that is important to you and to the people who support you and help get you elected. It's something that they put on their platform. So um, respectfully, I would just like to share some reasons why um, that stance concerns me greatly uh, as a parent who is very much a believer in public schools. Um, number one, charter schools get to pick and choose their students, and that is anti the antithesis of what public schools are supposed to do. Um, sure, if any one of our public schools could just kick out all the kids that were difficult to educate, they could all have a really great performance, but that's not what public schools do. Uh, they lack accountability, uh, both regarding standards and regarding finances. Uh, we can see examples of this all over this country. Uh, I was born and raised in Michigan, and there are a lot of examples of why charter schools don't always work out. And they get your money, and they can close their doors, and then they can send all those kids back to the public school, and those schools will not get a single dime to educate those kids for the remainder of the year, okay? Uh, probably most importantly, I don't know, it's hard to pick what's most important about the problems, right? Uh, they take away oversight from our local taxpayers. So um, as parents, as taxpayers in this district, I feel that we are entitled to have this forum to come and speak our mind, uh, to vote for the people who we want to make decisions about our education uh, for our kids. And charter schools will give all of that power to a private entity who wants to make money. Um, so, you know, part of the reason why this makes me very concerned is that I know that you are supported by entities, uh, including those folks that support Empower Texans. And that is a special interest group who has a stated goal of privatizing our public schools. So I will be watching, as I said, you're gonna see my face in this audience a little bit more because I have extreme concerns about Empower Texans and what they are trying to do at every level of our government. Um, you know, our school funding is gonna hit, what, 38% from the state next year? Um, I'd love to see this board, by the way, speak out like I've seen several other ISD boards about state funding and how it continues to be cut and put more and more burden on the people in this room and the people who can't be in this room. Um, our taxes will eventually have to go up and I don't know how much longer we have before we're gonna start being subject to recapture. Um, I think that that's concerning and I will also be speaking to our state representatives who obviously have much more power <laughs> in dealing with that problem than you do. Uh, but I have seen some other ISDs publicly make statements to say, don't blame us for a tax that's going up. Um, you know, the, there's the governor and the lieutenant governor both using language regularly blaming <laughs> local entities for our taxes. I'm gonna go off on a tangent, but I'll try to end it there. I appreciate the time. I genuinely do hope that you will reconsider that stance. Um, the STAR test has a lot of problems. And I think its end goal is not to measure education or teacher effectiveness. Uh, in fact, there was a study a few years ago that showed it's not effective at all in measuring those things. Um, and I think that its purpose is to do what's happening in HISD right now, which is call a school failing 
so they can shut it down and give it to a private entity. I don't want to see that happen in our district. So um, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Thank you, Ms. <clears throat> Item three, consent agenda. Uh, 3A, consider, uh, well, gotcha. consent agenda is, I didn't have any request to remove anything, so I would entertain a motion. I'd move approval of consent agenda as presented. Second. We have a motion, we had a second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? All opposed. All right, thank you, sir. Gentlemen, administrator? Uh, item five, I'm sorry, item four, consider approval of guaranteed maximum price amendment for life cycle to 2019 project and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and um, execute the contract document. Dr. No. Thank you, sir. I'll invite Easy Foster up to present this item. Good evening, Vice President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Stott, or Dr. No, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're not the first. I made that mistake. <laughs> He's out. <laughs> Mr. Sanders got me with that about three times last night. It's okay. Huh? Right. Next item. <laughs> well, it, it is my pleasure to bring forward for your consideration and approval uh, a guaranteed maximum price amendment for our 2019 life cycle project. Our life cycle 2019 project, as with our other life cycle projects, is our annual project that repairs, replaces, and maintains uh, major building systems such as air conditioning. Uh, heating systems, plumbing, electrical, fire sprinkler, roofing, building envelope, and athletics items uh, throughout the district. If you'll recall, on November 14th of 2017, you, our board, selected GTT as our district's CM at risk. It's our construction manager at risk for this project. Since then, our design team, IBI group, and, and our office have worked together uh, with GTT to negotiate a guaranteed maximum price for this project of $6,284,456. At this time, we're requesting approval of the project, of the guaranteed maximum price, so that we can produce and execute the final contract documents for it. And I'd like to point out, this is the final identified project from our 2015 bond election. So at this point, uh, once this one's approved, everything we said we were going to do will be under contract. Understood. I move time. we approve as presented. I second. I have a motion and a second. Discussion, gentlemen? Hearing none, all in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Doctor No, and yeah. thank you, Easy. <laughs> All right. I was going to promote you right there. Item, okay, we had 4B, consider acceptance of Bradley Elementary School construction project. Doctor No. Doctor Foster. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no All right, this time I'd like to bring forward for your consideration the acceptance as complete uh, construction project we, we call Flex 17. It's Bradley Elementary. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bradley Elementary was completed at the end of June in 2017 and opened for the 17-18 school year. Uh, attached to, to the board item is the uh, financial summary for the project. We finished the project with savings and savings on the construction contract uh, in totaling $885,414.17. Let it go. Mm -hmm. So at this point in the review, there's not actually a final payment due to the contractor, but this time we're asking you per our board policy to accept the project as complete. So moved. Second. Got a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? I, go ahead. No, go ahead, ahead I, I'd just like to publicly say when I saw that document that we had come in $885,000 in savings, that's a testament. I want to get that on public record to you and your department and the oversight that you have on these projects being such fine stewards of the money that these taxpayers have entrusted us with, uh, selecting the right contractors and the right CM at risk and, and the right personnel and the right vendors, in addition to the oversight that your department provides, we really want to say thank you for helping us steward that money so well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Without taking anything away from what he said, let me just tack on, okay, that you have a great team. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, from your architects and your engineers to our construction managers at risk. They're people that we can trust time and time again. Uh, $884,000 in a multi-million dollar project can get lost, but it didn't get lost. And so that's a great kudu to Brookstone in this particular case. It's happened other places. There, I'm not taking anything away from anybody else, but it is because we choose the right people, kind of people to do business with. And I thank you for your efforts in that on, on, on that too. Oh, Great we, job, we Definitely appreciate it. And team, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, item four. Six, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm skip right over that. All in favor? <laughs> All right. These passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Appreciate that. Um, item 4C, receive update on attendant zones for Oak Ridge feeder schools. Dr. Long. All right, Dr. Hines. Good evening, Vice President Williams, members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Noll. Uh, tonight, just wanted to come forward to just as an information item to update you on the progress of the work of the Attendance Boundary Committee. Uh, it is our hope to bring to you um, in January a final recommendation, but just wanted to take a few minutes tonight to give you a kind of a brief update of where we are and the work that's been done. Uh, just to kind of recap where we were, we were here, I was here earlier in September um, to, to talk about this process. Um, we, we do have to rezone from time to time. It's always been our, our position to try not to do that unless we really need to. Um, and one of the reasons we'll do it is when we have uh, growth, when we have a, a campus that's overcrowded or underutilized, and there are a lot of factors that could impact that, including um, you know new neighborhoods or uh, the addition of uh, apartment complexes or, um, you know, just the fact that we'll see students age uh, or we'll see uh, areas turn over again. So we see a lot of trends and later on I'll share with you a brief overview of the demographic study that you'll get the full report in January. Um, but um, there are reasons we do this. Most notably, of course, we continue to grow and that's a, obviously it's a, a good position to be in. Uh, because of that growth, um, we uh, are opening a new elementary school, and it is uh, such that's going to serve students in kindergarten through sixth grade. Um, this is just a, a current map of that part of the district where we kind of focused attention um, as we went in. And such is going to be in the Oak Ridge attendance zone. So really, we were going to look at the Oak Ridge side. Uh, there are some hot spots. I wanted to show some of the hot spots on the map, and I'll talk more about those in the demographic report, so I won't go into that detail here. Uh, but there is some growth, and then there, you'll also uh, hear a little bit about there's some areas where we're going to be declining in the future, so we want to look at that. Um, we are opening a new school. It's going to serve roughly 1,000 students. It's going to open in August. Uh, so we, we came together um, to look at this question. Suchman is going to be located uh, just south of 242. Uh, this is a map that kind of shows the relationship um, with irons. Uh, to Suchma, and it's uh, right there, uh, just south of 242. 10261 Harper School Road. There's a rendering of the new school. It's under construction, and Mr. Foster will share some pictures of where we are today. If it would, we would all be happier if it would slow down on the rain this, this winter. Um, so what are we trying to accomplish in this process? First and foremost, we came together to look at how do we uh, draw an attendance boundary for this new school. Um, we did want to leave some room for future growth because we know Harper's Reserve is still growing. Um, uh, so we want to have a little bit of room to grow in the future. Uh, while we are at it, we want to look at uh, some reducing some crowding at Oak Ridge Elementary, Hauser and Ford, um, as well as Vogel. And so all those schools are at capacity. Um, and while we were at it, we, we wanted to look at if there's anything we could do for Ride and Haley, both of those schools have a significant number of portable buildings, and so we wanted to look at whether we could do anything there. Um, we also were looking at, uh, we have a, a significant number of our students that are in the bilingual program that are zoned to Lamar that go to Glenlock, and because it's a large enough population to start our own program, we looked at that as a way if we could create some capacity at Lamar to return that program, to start a program at Lamar. So those were some of the things we went at uh, as we approached it. To do this, we, uh, we had a committee um, we had principals and parents representing several campuses in the uh, south part of the school district, really south central, mostly College Park and Oak Ridge feeder. Uh, and then we had some district resources, Mr. Caker and Dr. Stewart and Regina Woody Crane and um, Sam Davila from Transportation. And, uh, so together we've been, about 25 people on the committee have been working, uh, met several times. We also have had a process where we went out and we've, we've had a series of some public meetings where we've solicited feedback. We also have been taking feedback uh, on our website. And so to, to date, we've had about 250 comments and responses. Um, and we'll be back out in January to, to, to bring out our final recommendation uh, that we've been working on. And so I just wanted to take just a couple of minutes to summarize some of those things we're looking at. 
Again, these are the, the, the feeder um, boundaries in the current school zones. Um, and you can see, if you look up at the 242 area, um, Oak Ridge Elementary and Hauser more or less crisscross in this area. And that's where the new school is going to be, and that's where we're going to pull our students. And as we started working on this, I think one of the things that the committee came to and we wrestled with, and I, I will say over 25 different scenarios that we looked at, um, we finally came to the conclusion we were going to try to put as many students in the school as we possibly could because of its location. And it just, the reality is there's more students that live in this corridor than there's room in the school. Uh, so not everybody's going to get into the new school, and that's something that we've had to, to kind of wrestle with. Uh, the other reality is it, uh, because of its location and the number of students that we pull, uh, both Montgomery Creek Ranch and Glen Eagles, for example, have large student populations in those neighborhoods. And, um, and so because of that, we start looking at that number of students. Uh, it had an impact on the schools that will, uh, that will be touched. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, and what we did is we put together two scenarios after looking at, as I said, numerous. Uh, both options are going to present similar solutions. We try to impact the least number of families. You know, we understand people make plans and they make decisions about where they go to school. and uh, So we really try to do this to accomplish our goals but without impacting more people than we have to. Uh, so we are uh, going to give you a quick overview of the two that are out there right now. The first one is 1.2 uh, and this one the, uh, the light green area um, represents the new Suchma attendance boundary. And of course, and this area over here is really what is essentially Stonecrest Ranch. Um, and so uh, we've been talking about bringing that over. Um, and we'll talk more in the demographic areas, but it's, it's not a large number of students. Uh, but, but many of them are already on transfer going um, uh, west. So um, this kind of fixes that. And you can see uh, what this does. Uh, is it takes most of those areas off of 242 that are currently going to Oak Ridge and Hauser with the exception of 47L. And we use planning zones when we, when we plan. These are smaller increments, usually a neighborhood. Some of our neighborhoods are divided into more than one planning zone because there's just so many students. So we have to divide it into two or three or four. Um, and we, uh, we eventually got to the point where we filled up the school. Uh, Tall Timbers, 47L, and Glen Eagles on the north side of 242 um, were not included, so they'll remain at Oak Ridge under this plan. And really, you know, we would have liked to have fit them in, but it just didn't work, and they really remain because they're closer to Oak Ridge, and uh, we just did it geographically. Um, this roughly gets the new school at 850 students, so it's, it's going to open rather large. Um, and then all the other areas were zoned to it. Most of that impacts Hauser, and so uh, we were looking at ways then trying to take some students into Hauser. Um, both, both Oak Ridge and Hauser would be reduced. And so you can see um, zones 55 and 55A are on, right on the north side of Rayford that currently are zoned to Ford. Uh, under this plan would go to Hauser uh, to move some students into Hauser. Uh, that takes a little bit of, of uh, enrollment away from uh, Ford. It's approximately 88 students. Uh, Ford still has a few portables and that would hopefully uh, reduce uh, those. <clears throat> Another area is this area just on the west side of 45. It's, we, we label it zone 58. It currently goes to Lamar. It's roughly 100 students, and that would move to Hauser as well. And what that does is it creates ro room at Lamar for roughly 100 students where we could bring uh, the bilingual program uh, of the students that go that are zoned to Lamar that currently go to Glenlock can now have bilingual program at Lamar under this plan. And so um, by creating some room at Glenlock, we looked at this area, which uh, is uh, 70A, which is uh, uh, the north side of Timberlakes, uh, which is right down the street from Glenlock and moving that back to Glenlock. So um, we feel like we can solve for some crowding at Haley under this plan. Uh, we feel like we can, um, you know, uh, reduce some enrollment at Ford. We're going to reduce, um, and, and for intermediate school, it impacts just Vogel, uh, and we'll share that a little bit later. Um, and so this is really the, the option that the committee, at this point, really, I think, likes the most. And I'll share a little bit more why, um, but it is, um, 
It accomplishes not everything. It doesn't solve for ride under this plan, um, but it does uh, do a lot of those other things. So we, we really like it. Um, and you know, there's obviously pros and cons. I won't read all those to you. Um, you know, it does impact fewer people. Um, we don't um, just have to split uh, Jacobs Reserve under this plan. Um, we do get to reduce some crowding at several schools. Um, so we tried to limit the impact. So there's some pros and there's some cons. It doesn't reduce uh, really crowding at Glenlock, but what it does do is um, by our projections and our demographic reports, we think it'll, it will stop the growth. So it should level off Glenlock and it's been growing. And mostly Glenlock's growth has been through the bilingual program of students that are zoned to Lamar. So um, it actually um, would have an impact there. And the other, the other scenario that we've developed is really the same scenario, it just goes one step further. Um, and it's all those things that I described, um, but what it does do is it, is it takes um, an, an apartment area over off 1488 that is currently zoned to Powell and moves those students to Gladys. Uh, and the reason Gladys is because it's in the Woodlands feeder zone, so it keeps them in the same overall feeder zone. Um, but what that does is create some room at Powell uh, for us to look at moving some of the students from Ride, uh, out of Ride to Powell. Um, and so everything else was the same, but that was the biggest, uh, the biggest change. So we had divided uh, Jacobs Reserve as several zones, 75D, uh, 75G, and they would go from Ride to Powell. Um, and that has been very, uh, it's been very well received. Um, there are some, obviously, some limitations in that we would be splitting the neighborhood. Um, there are pros and cons with that as well, and all of the pros and cons of the other scenario. Plus, um, we do accomplish some, some reduction at ride. It doesn't take ride out of the portable business, but it does reduce ride by about 100 students. Um, and it does move students to PAL, so PAL stays roughly the same size under this scenario. Um, so it doesn't reduce PALs? doesn't reduce Powell. Um, but it does help ride. It does help ride, yes, sir. So it seems like this one accomplishes a little bit more, but it impacts more families. Yeah. But with the impact more families, it seems like you're moving folks from, the folks that are impacted the most have been moved from Powell to Gladys. Is that the, right? That's is a good number, yes. Yeah, I don't think they would mind. And, and, that's, um, that's a good trade-off. I think one of the... As long as you're still going into the same yeah they write down the a street from each yeah, other they're still going into the same feeders can we go back to the yeah they are junior high yeah I want to I want to I do want to stress that in high school. you know one of the reasons that that, that I I really want to take a look at and and I'll certainly share a little bit more in the demographic study is when we approached this um, we didn't involve the west side of the woodlands and and you know good or bad right or wrong we had a kind of a scope of the the schools that we looked at in the in the and the pieces that were at play. Um, and during this process, we did receive the demographic study. And, and when we started looking at it, one of the things that, that I think raises probably a fair question is whether we need to take a more comprehensive look at this. This 2.2 this might be a solution. I'm afraid it might only be part of a solution. And so um, my, my hesitation with 2.2 is only that I'm not sure we're looking at the whole picture as detailed as we need to look at it. So uh, that is the limitation. I'll share a little bit more of that in the demographic overview. But yeah. um, otherwise, there's some good, really good things with it. The downside of it is um, there's a lot of other pieces that we might need to look at if we're going to do this. So could you run that money one more time? I'm sorry, Scott. Oh, no, I just had a quick question. Oh, yeah. I'm in the ride, and I was just curious the projections of ride is going to continue to the projections in the long term of ride it'll get a little bit bigger and it should flatten out yeah. but this helps ride a little yeah. bit this league yeah, is this amazing. Amazing. the other one too does yeah. the ride was half empty when i got on the board yeah. <laughs> yeah. it was a, you know a different, a different yeah. number one so i don't see why they part yeah. part of the scenario the scenario that dr Hines is talking about is if we plan in the future to take a a bigger look at all of the Woodlands elementaries and we're, we will see in the demographic study we're going to have capacity in the back of the Woodlands the west part of the Woodlands mm -hmm. so if if we are going to move more students in the future in the Woodlands elementaries taking uh, a less invasive approach now would be wise 
because we wouldn't want to touch somebody twice. We'd hate to move somebody now and then be moving them again. And I think that's an example that would be Jacobs Reserve. If we looked at it and we found a way to keep the whole neighborhood together, and I'm not saying we would because it's a rather large number of students, but if we did, if we moved half now, later on that would kind of tie our options as far as what we would do because we don't want to move uh, a neighborhood several times. Yeah, we don't I want students to hit several schools during their time in elementary school. I agree with that, but as far as addressing immediate needs, are we... I mean, as far as Ryan and some of the other schools that we visited, I mean, there's some immediate need for relief from kids. Or, or I mean, how long down the road is it that we're going to start to engage in those discussions? Otherwise, he's, he, you know. I'm ready to go. So whenever, <laughs> whenever, whenever, whenever we say go, let's go. I mean, I, I think okay. we, we, gotcha. we, we, we would envision, I would think we would envision getting started on that right away as in the next school year. Um, I think we need to look at it. I, I just, me studying it, Okay. It, it really, I'd like to look at the whole picture and really look at it and make sure we're doing this so we don't undo something. Understand. <clears throat> when you go into that, the, that whole picture, I, I got to ask this question. At, at some point, when you're talking about doing everything, are you also considering not just changing uh, schools, but also potentially feeder zones where you may, you're going to have, you know, 100 kids here and five over here, but they both go to two different high schools, and it might make more sense to put them together. Is, is, do you see a scenario where that's coming down the road? A couple of things I'll say to that. One is we do look at that. It's harder and harder to do uh, as we get bigger. It's just harder and harder to keep pure feeders. Um, what, we, what we do try to do is uh, certainly I will say there's a lot more integrity starting as we get to junior high. Uh, we have split intermediates. We have split elementaries out there. Um, when we get to junior highs, they've been re they've remained pure at this time, which is what we're in favor of as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And we don't want to be doing that either. But it just seems like, you know, as I look at these lines, we're drawn here, and then another one over here yeah. because they happen to go to the same feeder. As we continue to grow, it it seems like it's going to have to be addressed. And I understand that that's uncomfortable, but it's going to have to be addressed at some point. So, number one, uh, the 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 option one has a, a smaller um, impact. impact, thank you, a, a smaller impact on more people. Option two, it, you know, what I'm hearing is option two makes a lot more sense because option one makes more sense because option two might be coming a little bit later on and we'll just, we'll, we'll hold off on making any more adjustments until we have to. Well, I mean, I think we, I think we need to fix ride. There's, there's no way around. Agree. There's no way around that. And uh, but I, I just think before we go at with a half fix that we don't study it a little bit more. Why move them east if you can move them west? But move them once, whatever. Move them once, whatever, and get the plan right. And that's and that's really what what. I think we can all agree. My, we, we've been down that road. Yes. Sir. Can we go back to the map just a minute? Yes, sir. It doesn't matter which one. It's a uh, bottom down here on the on the uh, west side of the theater. Fifty. Fifty-eight. Fifty-eight. Excuse me. Uh, they currently are zoned where? They currently go to Lamar, Wilkerson, Knox, College Park. Okay. And under this scenario, they would go to Hauser, Wilkerson, Knox, College Park. Okay. All right. You, you, you answered my question. But one, one last thing. You said they're closer to... Now, you said... Uh, is Stonecrest not uh, uh, zoned to... It is. It's on it's on the San Jacinto and Caney Creek. Creek. Yes. And so we are dealing with a change yeah. in that would be right a change over for Suchman for K six. And I'm I'm not arguing against it, but when we were just talking about it, I mean, that's an example of switching up. Um, it I mean, is that's a major switch. It is yes. on those families. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Especially if they've had one graduate from one. I mean, I've been down that road. Okay, but. What I want to point out are these two neighborhoods to the north, Glen Eagles and Tall Timbers. Tall Timbers, okay. They're not the closest to Oak Ridge, but size wise, they're the closest that make the numbers work. Correct. That's the problem because all that, uh, is it Harper Reserve right there that's they're going probably. around the south side of them? Yes, sir. Harper's Landing. Harper's Landing, yeah. excuse me. Harper's Landing. Uh, I mean, that, that is a whole lot of kids. That's, mm -hmm. that's the base for Suchma, right? Oh, oh, Harper's Preserve. Mm -hmm. um, and probably the biggest neighborhood is Montgomery Creek Ranch. 
in terms of enrollment. Okay, but I mean that that's also a newer neighborhood, right? Yes. So I mean it could be Still coming more. or whatever. But I mean, you know that that Harper's Harper's Reserve is closer to Oak Ridge. Does it not fit numbers wise? Is that what that's what I'm asking? It is. Uh, it fits numbers wise, but also we looked at traffic patterns. So eventually there will be a way um, to to get to the school without having to go on to 242 for everybody south. And so that's certainly something that we wanted to consider uh, where if I come out of a neighborhood and can go right on 242, and, which is why the north of 242. But yes, sir, to answer your question, yes, sir. My concern, Dr. Hines, is to, I know we're talking about elementary schools, is ride time for these smaller children. You know, whether it be bus or somebody else coming and picking them up. I, I know that, I, I presume that the attendance boundary committees are looking at how far they're having to ride in a car or ride on a bus. Uh, because I, I, I just worry about our, our, our students being out on the roads as, as we're a very heavily traveled uh, community. And I, I hope that as we're looking at shifting people, we're shifting them from maybe a 10 or 12 minute to commute to a eight or nine minute commute, you know, something that's gonna be less. Because uh, I think that's important to try to do. And I know that that's not always easy, like you said, where you're having to split up elementary schools and intermediate schools and break them into different feeder zones later on. But I, I really think that's important, that, that ride time that kids are having to be on the bus or getting to, having to get up in the morning to get to school or you know, be home after school. And the good news, I think, with, with Suchma, uh, everybody in that corridor that's going there is going to experience a decrease in their ride time. That's good. Hmm. All right. Um, All right. Yeah, All right. I'll keep moving. Um, intermediate, just a quick summary. Vogel would look, uh, would be the yellow area, and Suchma would be the, the light blue. One of the big questions we get a lot of is if my child's in the last year of their grade level, can they finish at their school? And, and our position's always been, in this case, if it was fourth grade or sixth grade, they could stay and finish uh, in their school uh, if they provide transportation. Um, so at this point, we're working diligently at this, and um, we we'll hope to have a recommendation back to you in January. If there are any other questions for me? Questions, gentlemen? No. Thank you, Dr. Hunt. I, I, I know that we know this, but uh, it's a team effort to make rezoning happen. I know, it seems but nice. it starts with the top, and we have the best in the business with Dr. Hines really leading that charge. Really Thank you, Dr. Team. Hines, for your work. With we have that. a great committee. We have really good folks. That work Dr. Hines and committee, to be commended. Great job. All right. Um, where are we? For E? D. Okay, D. Receive a summary of demographic study conducted by population and survey analysts. All right. PASA, Dr. No? Dr. Hines. Uh, right. so kind, of, <clears throat> kind of a uh, quick extension. Just a quick reminder, you're going to get this more comprehensive report from PASA. They will be here in January to present to you. Uh, so I don't want to steal a lot of their thunder. Um, but the reason this is important that you get some of this information is we shared information with our facilities planning committee. Uh, as part of their uh, looking at this process, and we wanted to make sure that you had access to some of this information uh, in advance of that. Um, just kind of a couple of quick reminders. Our school district enrollment in the Houston metro area uh, in 2017, we were ranked sixth. Um, we're just um, right under 63,000 students right now. Uh, from 2012 to 2017, um, we are ranked third in terms of numeric growth in the metropolitan area, uh, up 7,646 students. In terms of Texas, uh, from 16, 17 year to the 17, 18 year, we were ranked fourth in terms of uh, numeric growth with 1,816 student growth, or 3%. Of course, there was a hurricane in that year, and so that we know that impacted a lot of families. So one of the things that, that PASA does is uh, they, they look at um, many factors in trying to predict growth for an area. Um, they're looking at the economy and how strong the economy, jobs, they're looking at how many housing starts, right? So if there's places to live for people, and uh, then they're looking at what's the density, how many students are in a household, 
Uh, Geocoded has to do with how many students live in an area. We know that uh, we, one of the things that we wrestle with, and, and if you look carefully at some of the fine print, sometimes we say 812 students live in the PAL zone, but there's 860 students there. Where do those other ones come from? Well, there might be teachers who bring their children to school. So, or there might be a program that we have at a school that students go there. So geocoded living in an area doesn't necessarily translate to direct enrollment. I just wanted to clarify that. And then they look at recent trends, uh, and then they give us projections by planning units, and those are those little subdivisions that we use. Um, and together, the planning units make up uh, the attendance zone of a, of a school. Just a few demographic characteristics that are always interesting to look at what, what might be in store for us as a district uh, and how do we compare with the Houston area, uh, metro area. Our median age is 36.7, so a little bit more mature, more likely to have uh, children in that age population. Uh, our 20% uh, of our population is ages 5 to 17, just 1% bigger than the metro average. The household median income is higher. Um, the travel time to work is right at right near the average at 29.6 miles. Uh, our passing rate is higher than the state average. 40% uh, of our population has a bachelor's degree uh, compared to the metro average of 30%. 37.1% um, of our students are, uh, at the time of this, we're closer to 40% um, at this point. Um, and the state of Texas was 58.1%. So just kind of give you a little background. Uh, there, we know there's local economic trends. There's been a lot of growth in the Springwoods Village, the Exxon area, um, and certainly there's more um, industry coming this way and development in the Conroe area. So those are things that are being factored as they plan for trends. And then looking at housing trends, uh, our district has ranked second in annual housing starts in the metro area behind Fort Bend. Uh, so we can see there's a, a lot of housing going in. Uh, and there's also housing inventory that's increasing. Uh, so that, that is a, usually a sign that people are going to move here when there's places to live. And this is what passes projecting over the next five years is the blue, and then the next five years after that is the red. And so you can see kind of the prediction for housing, single-family housing, and multifamily housing. And, you, and they, they predict that that will pick up in the second five years. Uh, And I know one of the questions is where are the house is being built, right? So where are they going? Uh, and this is just kind of a quick kind of a summary of some of the developments that are going out there and which parts are uh, impacting our um, area. There's, for example, there's still building going on at the Meadows. Uh, we just talked about Harper's Preserve, um, as Mr. Husband was pointing out, south of 242. Um, Foster's Ridge is over uh, north of 1488 off O'Connor Road. That's an area that's still growing. That's in the bush uh, feeder zone. Uh, Wood Forest is uh, still growing, uh, which is Stewart uh, K6, uh, and that impacts the Conroe feeder. Uh, we've we've met, shared that there's a uh, Granger Pines going in off 3083, and there's a an, another Signorelli development going north of 105. Waukegan Way is another development on the east side. So there's a lot of of housing starts going on the east part of our school district um, and certainly down in the Grand Oaks area we've 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 seen that over and over it's been our fastest growing area for the last several years uh, one that we've we know is coming is the, an aria development uh, on uh, 242 at 1314 and that's coming and that's identified as well in the future so Grand Central Park is on here um, so there's several neighborhoods that have been picked up there's several going in along the south loop uh, in Conroe as well <laughs> So these are some of the where the housing starts will go. In terms of how many students do we get per house, currently we average uh, just over a half a student per household at 0.57, and for apartments, uh, just over a quarter student per apartment unit at 0.29. And looking at all the data, looking at the housing starts and uh, doing the things that, that PASA does. Uh, their prediction for us is to grow on average about 1,350 students over the next 10 years per year. So uh, that would put us right at 76,560 students 10 years from now. So that would be our expected uh, growth rate. So that's one of those themes. Students are coming. Um, 
We're going to get. We're going to continue to grow. It's not going to stop yet. Um, so the question becomes, where are we growing? So we can start to plan. And um, and this just gives us, gives us a quick overview at the high school level. Obviously, um, Conroe High School is where we show the most growth. By 2028, we show almost 7,000 high school students. Uh, we're we're just over 41. We're almost at 4,200 right now. Uh, so that's a growth of over 2,500 students. Caney Creek would go up 1,400 students in the next 10 years. Um, Oak Ridge would go up 389. College Park stays pretty flat under this scenario, and the Woodlands High School actually, they, they show us declining over the next 10 years. Um, so those are some things that, that we want to look at. In terms of junior high, the growth patterns kind of mirror the high schools in that Conroe area is going to continue to grow. Uh, keep in mind that uh, we've talked about our plan for um, repurposing Washington and then rezoning for uh, Stockton and Pete to get a little bit more balanced to, to plan for that future growth. Uh, but we know there's net almost 1,200 students that we predict to grow in the next 10 years in that area. Uh, Moorhead Junior High School uh, we know is going to go to near 2,000. York will go up to near 2,000 in the next 10 years. Irons, uh, which we're just completing an addition, will we'll continue to fill out. Um, Knox, like College Park, stays pretty flat, and McCullough starts to show some decline, uh, like the Woodlands High School, in the next 10 years. And that would be welcome, because we have a lot of portables over at McCullough, so that would be nice to drop down a little bit. Um, and then for intermediate school, again, very similar patterns. Uh, Bosman, Cryer, Stewart uh, go up significantly. Uh, Mitchell and Collins stay pretty flat. Uh, but Derrickson and Tuff, as K6s begin to decline, and this is what we were talking about in terms of really we want to take a look at the, the elementary a little bit to, as we rezone. Um, Wilkerson, we know, will stay, uh, have a little bit of growth. Uh, we know there's some options then going west. Uh, Cox and Clark. Uh, Clark will have some growth. Uh, and then, of course, we ha they, they do not have the Suchma boundary yet, so they can't put that into their planning, just like they don't have the Stockton boundary yet. And then elementary uh, student growth. Uh, Stewart probably catches your eye when you see that uh, shows them growing by 1,200 students. Um, that's that's an area that we would want to plan for. Yeah, and, and that's a that's a new flex school. Look at Giesinger. Yes, that's not a flex. Uh, school. No, I'll say and then look at Giesinger, <laughs> 500 students. Um, so Ooh. the west side of Conroe, we, we need to, and, and you'll hear from the facilities planning committee. But obviously, we think that's an area we want to target. Um, the San Jacinto or the East County area, we know we're going to need to have some capacity. Um, obviously, in the next 10 years, we'll probably have to have two schools in East County at least. Um, so there's some growth coming. Um, you can see that there are other areas where it's you know, Wilkinson grows nearly 400 students, um, and, and Milam, Creighton, Austin, San Jack all show uh, growth. Um, and that's certain that we have to really look at because Austin is at capacity now, um, and they show 500 student growth. And, Creighton is also at capacity now, so we've got to do something out there, and that'll be our number one priority um, coming out. So this gives you an idea. Snyder shows growth. Broadway, it starts to level off at uh, Burnham Wood and Bradley. Um, and so Kaufman, moderate growth with the Meadows. Um, so this kind of gives you just a quick overview, but you can see where Tuff and Derrickson have the decline. Buckaloo will show some decline, which is not a bad thing because Bush goes over um, by 400 students. And that's with Foster's Ridge, so it gives us the ability. We'll have some capacity to move students over, uh, and that's something we'll be planning for. So that's just a quick overview of where we're at. Thank you, Dr. Hines. That was a wealth of information, and I'm greatly appreciated when those things take for you guys to compile all that and disseminate it. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, item 4, we're in E now. E, receive recommendations of the 2018 Facilities Planning Commission. Committee, uh, Dr. No. Yes, thank you. Well, we've uh, kind of seen through the last two items that we are going to continue to grow. Uh, that is a trend, and, and as was pointed out in this, that early pass the study, um, 
we expect to be at 76,000 students in the next 10 years. And over the previous 10 years, we've grown by over 15,000 students. And when you put that in perspective and think about you know, other local districts, you know, that's more than uh, the size of Magnolia, more than twice the size of uh, Willis or Montgomery. So we, we just continue to grow and add schools. And just over the last 10 years, we've had two bonds uh, that our voters have approved. The last one went out in 2015. It was built as a four-year bond. Uh, and as Mr. Foster mentioned earlier, we just approved the final um, contract for the items that would be included in that bond. But over the last 10 years in, in those two bonds, we've built 12 new schools. We've had major renovations and additions to uh, many schools, uh, significant investment in safety and security uh, at our buildings, as well as technology and programmatic improvements in the area of CTE, robotics, science uh, as well. We've been able to do that and manage those two bond packages over the last 10 years while also maintaining the second lowest tax rate in the Houston area. And um, to add on to that, with, with this board's leadership and thanks to your leadership, um, we've also built an elementary school and multiple additions and projects totaling over $100 million from fund balance, meaning we were able to complete those projects without incurring any new debt. And then by doing that, uh, we were able to uh, avoid approximately $63 million of interest payments that we would have paid on that $100 million had we uh, had to finance that. So we thank you for your leadership uh, in allowing us to, to make those improvements in our district. In June of 2018, the board received information uh, on the status of our current facilities as well as our long-term plan for our facility usage. Based on that information, the board requested the PASA study that Dr. Hines just shared uh, the overview with you tonight. And you also, also authorized the formation of our facility planning committee uh, to assess the needs of our district moving forward. The facility planning committee was convened and has worked very diligently over the last few months to assess the status of our current facilities and identify areas of need over the next four years. Their task was to make a recommendation to the board that would address these needs while impacting the tax rate as mentally as possible. Here tonight to share the committee's recommendation with the board is Mr. Cody Bartlett. Thank you, and Dr. Hines, that's a great lead in for me tonight, so appreciate that. Good evening, Dr. Knoll, members of the board. As Dr. Knoll said, my name is Cody Bartlett, and I had the pleasure of serving alongside 26 other dedicated community members on the 2018 Facility Planning Committee. The committee members represent non-CISD employee representatives from each of the district's feeder zones, along with representatives from the community groups and the business community, all of whom want the very best for the students in Conroe ISD in the most fiscally responsible manner. The committee began meeting in the beginning of October and met over the course of seven meetings in 14 hours and filled up this binder <laughs> to come up with the recommendation I'll present to you tonight. Before I do, I'd like the members of the Facility Planning Committee who are present tonight to please stand and be recognized. In addition to the committee members, numerous representatives from the district, including those in central administration, campus level, and engineers and architects were present at each meeting and all freely gave information and addressed any questions or concerns we had. To each of you that took part in this process, we say thank you. Great job. During our meetings, we listened to in-depth presentations and received information regarding the purpose and process of the committee the state of the schools, the history of previous CISD bonds, and the current financial position of the district. We also had lengthy discussions and received information on safety and security, CTE, early college programs, athletics, technology, transportation, auxiliary buildings, life cycle projects, growth, land, and the most recent positive demographic study, to name a few. During this immensely comprehensive process, I believe one of the most beneficial things we did was to meet at campuses varying in grade level, age, and size to see firsthand the needs of some of the facilities along with some of the unique benefits of each campus. With the average age of a CISD facility being 28 years old, 
we were exposed to facilities on both ends of that average. We walked the halls of Grand Oaks fresh with blue and orange paint. We saw level changes at Conroe High School and Dodge Weather as we visited each of the six buildings on campus. <laughs> we saw the beams of Stockton Junior High rising and heard the creaks of Oak Ridge High School. We walked through the cafetorium of Collins Intermediate and we even took a ride on a new Bluebird school bus. And we concluded by sitting right here in this boardroom to work through the projects to put together the package I present to you tonight. As mentioned earlier, at the heart of every discussion was what is best for the students of this district, what are the needs of this district, and does this project make financial sense? With that in mind, we categorized the projects into the following areas. Conroe High School, Oak Ridge High School, Growth and Sustainability, Safety and Security, and District-Wide Needs. Conroe High School. I'll begin with the master plan for Conroe High School. With the passage of the 2015 bond, construction began to update and renovate Conroe High with the intent to continue on the next bond issue. We have allocated funding in this proposal to finish that master plan. Many challenges exist on this campus ranging from security with multiple buildings and students crossing outside, weather playing a factor along with the design of the current campus and the number of level changes in buildings that exist. The plan proposed addresses each of those issues and when renovations are complete, Conroe High School will all be under one roof. This project solves many issues and will breathe new life into the district's original high school and the Conroe community. Oak Ridge High School. We recommend an overhaul to Oak Ridge High School to upgrade many of the systems throughout this nearly 40-year-old campus with some cosmetic updates as a byproduct. The audit auditorium and gym will be evaluated for potential improvements as funds allow and will also include new window systems for the campus. In addition, we recommend a CTE conversion at Oak Ridge, adding space for robotics program, automotive technology, and engineering design programs. Growth and sustainability. Based on known growth patterns, current enrollment, and information received from the PASA demographic study, we recommend the following new schools to accommodate growth. <clears throat> One new elementary school in the Grand Oaks feeder zone. One new elementary school in the Conroe feeder zone. One new elementary school in the Caney Creek feeder zone. And one new junior high in the Caney Creek feeder zone. Doing so would also allow us for the use of current Moorhead junior high as an intermediate. In an effort to increase capacity and upgrade programs in space, we recommend additions and upgrades to the Woodlands College Park High School, the Woodlands High School, Caney Creek High School, Conroe High School ninth grade campus, York Junior High School. To again accommodate growth of the district, we recommend land purchases for future campuses. A new outdoor practice pool to allow for increased practice space for our six high school programs. Currently, Conroe ISD ranks at the bottom compared to peer districts in lane meters of water. This new outdoor pool would be located next to the natatorium on land the district already owns. And the addition of a North County Agricultural CTE complex. This facility would be utilized by students participating in ag programs at Conroe High School and Caney Creek High School and serve as the district's home base during the Montgomery County Fair. The location of this facility would be on the land donated by Montgomery County adjacent to the Montgomery County Fairgrounds. The sustainability issues we recommend include mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and HVAC upgrades and overhauls at Creighton Elementary and Glenlock Elementary. The addition of a gym at Collins Intermediate and Wilkerson Intermediate, the only two intermediate schools in the district without a gym. And additionally, a new gym at Runyon Elementary. Reconstruction of the tennis courts at Knox Junior High School. Athletic field conversions. Doing so eliminates our reliability on water and allows usage of the field regardless of weather with the exception of lightning. These conversions would benefit athletes, drill teams, and band members in addition to attracting other contests to our district facilities. We also recommend an annual expenditure for life cycle and sustainability issues relating to the normal wear and tear of our buildings within the district and issues that must be addressed to keep our campuses functioning. In regards to safety and security, we recommend an annual expenditure upgrading our safety and security spread out over each campus, including vestibules, cameras, locks, windows, and fencing, all in line with the district's layered approach to campus security. Finally, district-wide needs. We recommend 
additions, upgrades, and expansion of our existing auxiliary facilities to accommodate growth and extend the lifespan of those facilities, including the transportation centers, maintenance and custodial facilities, and a new professional development center. We also recommend the repurposing and transition of existing auxiliary facilities to better serve the district. These facilities include the Jet Center, which is a 98-year-old building, Hawk, and Washington Junior High. We recommend annual expenditures for network and infrastructure to upgrade our technology and enhance our safety and security. And finally, the purchase of new buses to support the nearly 400 daily routes driven in 2,200 daily runs. As a committee, we make this recommendation of projects and do so after having received an incredible amount of information and participated in hours of discussion regarding the needs of this district as we look towards the future. We are very fortunate in Conroe ISD to be in superb financial shape. And because of that, and the confidence in our leadership, the 2018 Facility Planning Committee unanimously recommends a bond proposal with contingency and inflation accounted for in the amount of $827,476,195. Thank you. I'd like to reiterate Mr. Bartlett, what I said to Mr. Fowler, thank you, all you guys, for countless hours and the dedication that you put forth. And, uh, you know, y'all need a lot more recognition. And I just wanted to give you a shout out that thank you so much for all your hard work for everybody that's involved. Agreed. I think we all echo that. Absolutely. Cody, I'd like to add that you did a tremendous job of putting a whole lot of information in a succinct, uh, uh, very professional. Uh, that that was a good job. Great job. I'd like we, add, we, I'm sorry. I'd like to add my thank you to the entire committee for all your hard work and your efforts. Uh, it's a lot to get around to these schools when you go from Grand Oaks High School all the way north and and west and east. It's a lot of uh, driving, it's a lot of time, and it's a lot of energy. And I just want to personally thank each and every one of you for all of your efforts. It is greatly appreciated. Yeah, I, I echo that. I'd like to definitely commend you guys for actually taking a hands-on approach and going to each one of those, or a few of those campuses. How many of you visited? And you can see the, the massive district that we are a part of and, and understand the challenges we're faced with. And you guys are able to help us address those challenges. So. Really appreciate that. Can't say that enough. And trust me, sometimes we do those uh, board field trips, and I have to drive all the way out to the Creek. And uh, so you get the you gravity of, of what we're working with, and how many students we represent, and the massive um, land that we cover. So great job. Appreciate that, guys. I'd like to thank the district personnel as well. Um, I stood at that podium where Cody was at back in 2015 and gave that speech and sat on that committee and. Uh, you know, the community members that sit there do a tremendous amount of work, but the, the behind the scenes information gathering from the vendors, from finance, from planning and construction, from transportation, um, everybody in the district office puts in so much uh, effort to bring that information to the committee. So thank you to the district as well. Great job, ladies and gentlemen. And if, if I could, I'll, I'll yes, express please. my thanks to you as well. Um, and the, the, uh, nicest thing I can do for you at this time, because you've given us so much time, is to say, this is an appropriate time if you would like to leave. You're welcome to stay. But I know you're looking for a way to exit gracefully. And now we say you can leave, and we will clap you out. It's a lot of work. Thanks, JJ. It's a lot of work. Thanks, guys. All right. Um, item 4F, receive capital improvement updates. All right, Mr. Dr. Foster. No. All right. I appreciate now this opportunity to bring you up to speed on our capital improvements we have underway throughout the district. I'm going to start you with Sutchum Elementary. And you heard our description earlier today about rain. We've been battling rain on this particular project. It is currently still on schedule, scheduled to open in August of 2019. And the project is nearing a point where rain is not, I mean, it's still an issue, but we're, we're able to battle it more efficiently now. You can see from the overhead picture here, the paving areas around the building are coming along well over the course of the last week. They've gotten even further. 
uh, the building structure is nearing uh, its point where we call it topped out. And the roofing is, is started on the on the what is the plan north of this this building, the gymnasium that area as well. On the inside of that, what makes it more efficient for us to work in it is putting the walls up, bring it into a dry condition. So you can see the masonry has started in earnest, and the contractor has worked with their crews and their subcontractors to make sure we have enough labor and material on hand to to overcome the weather as it as it's been happening to us. Moving on to Austin Elementary, uh, this is a building addition that's going to facilitate us taking some of the older portions of that building out of service as they've reached the end of their useful life. Uh, from this picture, you can see the building structure here is also moving, moving out, uh, which will be to the left of, of this screen. The bright white area is the new, is half of the new building we're building. Since this picture was taken about a week ago, the building structure has reached almost the end of the building slab that you see there. So the, this building is scheduled to be uh, finished essentially as we enter the summer uh, so that we can use the summer to demolish the, uh, the areas that we are taking out to recreate the play areas that become the out outdoor play areas for that campus. Inside that building, much like such, such mud, the, the masonry, the building systems, everything has moved along just as we had anticipated. As, as, as I reported, the building is finishing as we enter the summer. The project finishes over the summer for school in August of 2019. At Irons Junior High, where we added some capacity to help with that, uh, the growth that you see in the past study that Dr. Hines presented, that project is done for all intents and purposes. The, uh, the, you shared the building exterior is done over the holidays. They're uh, replanting the grass in the yard and cleaning up the areas around the building. Inside that building, it is outfitted and ready for students when they return in January after the following winter break. At Stockton Junior High School, uh, that building is under construction, it's scheduled to open in August of 2020. So it is uh, large scale. You can see the building structures following the building slab as it moves around. The paving on that site is largely complete. Uh, so now we're working on the power and the infrastructure and everything to make that building come alive as it, as it moves on through its processes. Inside that building, I mean, it's building systems, it's structure. We'll be starting masonry and that stuff over the next several months. It is on schedule and uh, uh, as larger schedule weather is not as much of an impact there at this time, but they're still battling every day like everybody else. At Conroe High School, the additions and renovations, where the building addition helps us facilitate the major overhaul of the main campus. Just like the building addition at Irons, Conroe High School's building addition, building addition is largely complete. You can see from the inside of the classrooms, it is ready for students when they return after the winter break. So students move into it, which starts the real story of this project, which is the overhaul of the main campus. As uh, students move in here for winter break, we're going to be using the winter break to start making a for real mess in the main campus. Uh, so as we work our way around upgrading those building systems, the air conditioning, the electrical, the plumbing, the things as we move around and uh, touch those campuses, that, that process is going to take the next 12 months and we'll be on that campus through December of 2019. Are you taking out first and second story of one wing at a time or all four? Well, we're, I mean, we're well, all both of them upstairs yeah. and downstairs. So we're, we're, I wish it were that simple. Uh, but we are working with the campus administration to work as try, try to as invasive as this project is we want to work with them to minimize the impact on the students so we want to work in an area and just like in zoning we want to try to move people once we're doing the same thing there so as we move we're trying to move around the building at a, as a in a methodical way it's like over the Christmas break or the winter break we're working on the second floor of the most recent science wing to start the process that's where all the building utilities connect to the existing building from the new central plant so there's a lot of work doing in there to prepare the next sections but we'll be taking over sections uh, intermittently as we go through the school year uh, as we get things ready but it, it's a a pretty intense planning effort never mind i'm sorry I <laughs> <laughs> just, just do what you got to do, you gotta do. Yeah, just ask yes or no questions thanks, thanks john good job. i'm good at not yes or no answers. <laughs> Well, we appreciate that. So, and, and that is really our update. Uh, I mean, we're happy to report to Connor High School is proceeding exactly as we had planned. So for the winter break, we're exactly where we plan to be at this time. And we're moving forward. Like I said, we'll be there through, the, through this time next year. And that's our update. Thank you, Easy. Appreciate that. Great job, as always. Um, item 5A, receive financial report. Mr. Rice. I like that tie, man. <laughs> in the spirit yeah <laughs> well, good evening vice president williams members of the board dr noel it is my pleasure 
to present the financial statements for the district for the month of November. Oops, got a little ahead of myself. Time's up. Here we go. Uh, these statements will include the general fund, debt service, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. The first statement we'll look at this evening is our balance sheet. Our balance sheet includes our assets, liabilities, and fund balances of the district. Uh, each month, we like to take a look at our cash and investments. And once again, we'll concentrate on our general fund. You'll see we have cash on hand of $13,300. Uh, bank deposits of $311,000. Investments in the state pools of $43,000. Forty-three million two hundred uh, investments with Wood Forest National Bank of thirty point three million. Currently, we have no short-term investments. Our last short-term investments did mature. Um, our investments with TCG Investment Advisors fifty-two point one million for total cash and investments of one hundred and twenty-six million dollars. We can begin tracking our property tax collections, uh, and as you can see, we're a little over a percent ahead of where we were last year, so collections are coming in well. The next statement we'll look at is our income statement. Our income statement includes our revenues and expenditures. Our revenues are broken down into three categories that include local and intermediate sources, state program revenues, and federal program revenues. Taking a look at the detail of our local and intermediate sources, uh, you can see where the property taxes are coming in now in the general fund and debt service, uh, food sales and child nutrition, and our premium contributions there in our self-funded insurance. And we can also look at our year-to-date expenditures by major category for each of the funds. <clears throat> this is our 2015 bond referendum status update. Uh, we've currently expended and encumbered $488.8 million. Uh, we have an estimate still to complete of $35.9 million, leaving us a total project forecast of $524.8 million. That'll leave us with about $3.6 million worth of contingency. Uh, Self-funded insurance for the year, we have total revenues of $12,455,000. We've had total expenses of $12,197,000. For our revenues over expenses currently of $257,659. Uh, <clears throat> participation at our wellness centers continues to be strong. You can see that our employees are starting to, to choose our wellness centers as their means of receiving uh, uh, health benefits, so we like that. We're averaging about $570 a month. Our investments for the month of November. Uh, par value of our total portfolio is $324.3 million. Please remember that, that that is made up of several funds. The general fund is just one piece of that. The largest portion of that is our capital projects fund because we had those bond sales. We're waiting on the projects to close out and that we'll be paying that down. Right. Um, our pools are yielding 2.44%. Our investment with Wood Forest National Bank, 2.52%. Our longer-term investments with TCG Investment Advisors, 1.68%, um, leaving us with a combined portfolio of a WAM of 50, 50 days with a yield of 2.34%. Uh, the yield to maturity of our benchmark, which is the 90-day T-bill, is at 2.32%. Uh, Glad to see we're back above. Yes, sir. Yeah, from last month. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Good job, Mr. Rice. Thanks, All right. Item six A, executive session. A closed meeting of the board will now be held on matters uh, contained in the notice for this meeting, as authorized by Section five five one point zero seven four of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Should the board determine that a final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any action considered in such closed or executive meeting or session? then such final notice, final decision, or final vote shall be either A, this public meeting upon reconvening of the public meeting, or B, at a subsequent public meeting of the board upon notice thereof as the board members, as the board shall determine. A closed session of the board will now be held. It is 7.50 p.m. 7.48. I'm honored to make a motion that the following as the officers of the new uh, makeup of the board, and that would be as president, Mr. Datron Williams, first vice president, Skeeter Hubert, second vice president, Scott Moore, 
Secretary Ray Sanders, Assistant Secretary Scott Kidd, Past President John Husbands, and Trustee Dale Inman. Thank you. I second it. Oh. Got it already. Have a motion to second. All in favor, gentlemen. Congratulations. Passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate your vote. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it, gentlemen. I appreciate the vote of confidence. Move to it. Oh, well, one more item. Uh, one more item. Okay. One more item. One more. Item. Your, your uh, conduct. Oh, next item of ag on agendas. Ms. Gladys. Is, is your your affirmation after each election of your code of conduct for the board? If you um, you can visit about it, or if you want to, you can just sign the acknowledgement sheet and give those to me. I'll put them in your files. Um, you just need to sign. Here, yes, well, I need that can, top one. Can I give this back tomorrow? I'd like to read. Them. Sure. Yeah. No, I gave it to you at the um, the training too. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Did I already sign one to give it back? No, 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 because it was an agenda item. Thank you. There, there. Sanders, do you want your copy or? Do you, I mean, I just need nope. to. Okay. Nope. I'm good. That's like uh, I've read it. I know you have. Okay. Yeah, okay. I got you. That makes sense now. Signed it. Eight years now. Ten years. Now? That one's yeah. for you. Yeah. I just got a big upgrade in her. Well, every two years. Year 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 my third. Yeah. Or no. Hand. That means you have to wait ten. Yeah. 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 <laughs> motion. We have a second. Any questions, concerns? All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it once again. We adjourn.